it's so important that we are learning to take care of ourselves, our mental health, our physical health, and our emotional health. So self-care is not selfish. I know we all have a lot of responsibilities in life, to our family, our society, our workplace, and, and, so, and we can get lost in all of that to such a degree that we forget to take care of ourselves. The airline industry is not telling us to be selfish when they tell us to put our own oxygen mask on first before helping someone else. They're saying it's practical. They're saying even if it's your child, put your mask on first because if you lose consciousness, you're not in a position to help anyone else at that time. Right? You just can't help anyone. So that selfishness is not actually selfishness. It's necessary. It's a practical message. And like I was saying earlier, our society places a ton of emphasis on physical health, physical well-being, but not on our mental health. And there's a stigma surrounding mental health. We're embarrassed to talk about it. Yeah. We don't have a problem telling our friends or colleagues or family members, hey, I've, I've got to go to the dentist. Oh, I've got to go see a doctor. I'm having stomach issues or whatever. But when it comes to mental health, we don't want to say anything because we don't want people thinking there's something wrong with me, that I'm incapable, I'm in incompetent. But what I'm really hoping is that we can re remove the stigma and make this a normal part of our conversation. If we only focus on our physical health and ignore our mental health, in my opinion, that's like taking your car to the car wash regularly, but never taking it to the mechanic. Making sure the car is shiny on the outside, looking sparkling clean. But you look under the hood, the whole thing's about to collapse. The stuff under the hood is much more important, actually. If your car is dirty, that's fine. It'll still get you going the rest of your life. So we have to realize this is a complete machinery from head to toe. And it's our responsibility to take care of it. And we shouldn't feel embarrassed or incompetent. If we need to take a mental health day, or if we need to encourage someone else to do the same, especially now, for those who are leading others, encouraging them to do that if they need to, right? Having conversations around this topic, it is so important. Because if we don't take care of our mental health, then without mental health, what other kind of health is there? Right? I think, you know, it's, as Jill mentioned, this unfortunate incident happened. Nobody in their right mind would do something like this. Anywhere. And mental health needs to be examined when it comes to this. And I think it's so important that we are ma making sure we're paying attention to our own mental health and keeping an eye out for people around us that may be struggling with their mental health and reaching out to them and making ourselves available to listen to them. A lot of this can be avoided if we are making ourselves available to others and offering our support and help and care with empathy. So mental health is something that we, I think, really need to keep talking about more and more. What calms you down? Is it reading a book, soft music, taking a warm bath? Like, let's be conscious. If this is for us. This is an investment in us. What calms me down? What relaxes me? And actively do those things. Plan to do those things. That, okay, this evening, I'm going to read a, a book, and I'm going to take a warm bath. I'm going to do this for myself so I can get a good night's sleep. Right? Invest in ourselves, in our own self-care. Now, when, we, when it comes to mindfulness and leadership, right? how do they combine? How do they come together? How do we combine mindfulness and leadership? Well, one is, as a leader, we might think that we have to just show up in terms of productivity. But we also have to show up in the way we're taking care of ourselves. We have to do the things we're asking others to do. If we're asking others to take care of their well-being, then we need to show that we're taking care of our well-being. We need to actually lead by example. And I could think of two great examples of individuals who actually led by example are Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr. They didn't just let others do the difficult tasks. They did it themselves. And because they did it, it inspired a whole nations to follow their lead. But we need to do the things, if we're talking about self-care, if we're talking about mindfulness, then the people need to see that my leader is also mindful, that my leader emphasizes work-life balance, but the leader is also doing it themselves. 
But if, but if we talk about work-life balance to our teams and our groups, and then we're sending 2 a.m. emails on a Saturday, that's a contradiction in our messages. Our messages and actions are not lining up. If they see an email at 2 a.m., we're just causing them anxiety because now they're thinking, I should have responded at 3. Like, is that what the expectation was of me? Right? So even if you're the type that needs to send a 2 a.m. email, I'm hoping you don't. But if you do, just schedule it to go out at 8 a.m. on Monday morning. That feature is pretty easily available, right? So what we, it's important that we ask ourselves, am I doing the things that I'm asking others to do? Now, I'm going to share with you one example of an individual who had a very interesting way of leading, very accessible, very down to earth, very humble. The, is a former CEO of Japan Airlines, Haruka Nishimatsu. Now, it was really interesting when I learned about him is that he would take public transportation to work. CEO of a major airline, right? He would take public transportation to work. And then, he, he never used his office really. He wanted to sit in an open space with his colleagues and coworkers. Because he wanted to be accessible. He didn't want to create a boundary between him and everyone else. He wanted others to be able to come up to him, to talk to him, to share ideas, share concerns. So he would just sit in an open space with them. And when it was lunchtime, he would get in line with everyone else, didn't want any preferential treatment. He would get in line, get his own lunch, and again, sit in a common space with his colleagues so people felt connected with him and he could be connected with other people. And you could also see him, that's after the airplanes landed, he would sometimes go in, talk to the flight attendants about their experience. Even you could see him putting back magazines and newspapers. Just, he just felt like one of the employees. He never treated himself as a CEO. And so th therefore you could see that people felt very comfortable with him. And one time he explained that when the company at one point wasn't doing so well, so he had to give a lot of pay cuts. And he said, just to be fair, I gave myself a pay cut as well. Kind of unheard of, right? Because <laughs> the only person that was unhappy that he gave himself a pay cut was his wife. <laughs> You say, everybody else was fine with it. So now, I'm sharing him as an example that hopefully something of his life we can take inspiration from. Now, we don't have to tear down our office and just sit in an open space or start taking the bus to work. I'm not saying we have to do this, but let's find ways to be accessible, to be approachable. And I think that's really important because that's what creates a bond. When people feel like they have a bond and a connection at work with each other, with the CEO, with the leaders, that creates a powerful environment. Because right? as leaders, we want to inspire. We don't want people to fear us. We want people to be inspired by us. Inspiration carries a lot more weight than fear does. This is one of the key things, I think, in being a mindful leader, is on a regular basis, on a regular basis, appreciating the contributions of our colleagues. I think this is absolutely crucial. According to, there was a, there's many articles, one I found from the Huffington Post says, appreciation motivates employees to work harder and it prevents them from developing a wandering eye. They're not putting up their resume on LinkedIn because that can be done very easily. And there was some very interesting research done by Wharton. They were going to make fundraising calls. And they decided to divide up their fundraising team into two. The first team made calls as they normally would, and the second team received a call from their supervisor appreciating the work that they were about to do. The second team that received a call beforehand made 50% more fundraising calls on their own than the first team. Showing that when we are appreciated, when we feel valued, we are much more likely to go above and beyond what's asked of us. And so, we can't emphasize enough. As human beings, a paycheck is good, but it's not good enough. We want to feel valued. And there's two components of appreciation. One, it has to be done timely, not like six months later. Like, oh, by the way, you know, six months ago, uh, September of last year. It's good, <laughs> better late than never, I guess. But timely and specific. People want to know that you notice something specific that they did. So if we have, I don't know how many people we oversee, 
But it doesn't even have to be people we oversee. It could be equals, it could be peers, any colleagues. Just making it a habit of appreciating one another. When it comes to empathy, this is one way to do it. Listening to understand and not to respond. Okay, I'm guilty of it, so I'm gonna ask you, how many are guilty of coming up with responses while others are still mid-sentence? <laughs> so, just to give you an idea, when we start to formulate a response, our brain no longer is able to listen to what they're saying. It's just not happening. So here's an example. Has this ever happened when you're having a face-to-face -face conversation with someone and you sort of zone out? And you're, they're talking to you but you start thinking of something else? And you're no longer even listening to what they're saying? Not intentionally, but you zoned out. You start thinking, of, you didn't even hear what they're saying. And you're two feet from them, your ears are open, but none of the words actually registered. So our brain can only do one thing at a time. We're, we can't multitask. There's even research showing that we can't multitask. If we could multitask, well here's proof that we can't multitask. We failed miserably at texting and driving. Miserably, right? That means we can't multitask. Otherwise, we'd have no problem with that. It's only two things. So when we, when we catch our mind, so what I've done is that when I start to catch, when I catch my mind coming up with a response, I just tell it to shut down. I just tell it to stop, like keep listening. Remember, the mind's on autopilot. It's just going, you gotta shut it down. You gotta let them keep listening. And if you're afraid I might miss this really great idea, don't worry about it, give them the respect. And the, all the right ideas will come to you. I've noticed every time I fully hurt someone out, the end of the result of the conversation was great. Because they felt respected, they felt heard, and then they gave me the same respect. A very important communication formula I'm gonna share that's gonna improve your communication 100%. Everybody ready for this one? This is gonna involve a little bit of monk wisdom here too, okay? That's it. That's why they flew me out to Belmont, just for this slide here. They saw this slide and like, yeah, we gotta have you come out here. And so the, the point of this slide is that we have two ears and one mouth. I know, I dropped some serious monk wisdom very early in the morning, right? Now I'm gonna take it to a different level in just a moment. Now, fortunately we were created with two ears and one mouth. Can you just imagine if humanity was created with two mouths and an ear? I think we've gotten ourselves into enough trouble with one of these. Two would have been a disaster. We would have been on our 10th world war, I'm sure, maybe the 20th, who knows, right? One mouth has been enough of a disaster. So now the, the deeper part of this philosophy, hold on to your chairs, because you may fall off after I tell you this. We were created with our ears naturally open and our mouth naturally closed. Somebody didn't want us opening our mouths, <laughs> right? So we have to make an effort to open our mouth. But the ears are always open. It's not like when you go to sleep, you know some of those cars have a, the, the side mirrors fold in. It's not like the mirror, the, our ears just kind of go whoop, right here, you know? They don't do that. They remain open all the time. They alert us to danger and everything all the time. So we're being told that we should speak, you know, listen twice as much as we speak, and really listen attentively. So if we do this, I think it'll improve not just our communication, but also our relationships with the people around us.